Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and today I am pleased to introduce Mike Stewart. How are you? I'm doing very good, Ria. Thanks for having me. So you're all the way in Texas. Yep, out here in the big state of Texas, uh, one of the few liberals uh, that uh, live out here. <laughs> so I'm a rare breed. <laughs> well, you're a rare breed, having been in the super yacht industry, coming all the way from Texas. Yeah, um, I kind of I was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the time, so it wasn't that rare. Uh, it was an easy transition to make uh, to get on the super yachts because it's pretty much. I, I mean, uh, well, maybe not that, but in 1997 when I jumped on the Limitless. Uh, Fort Lauderdale was pretty much the super yacht capital of the world, it seemed like, anyway, to me. Well, and that's why we have you here, because, you know, one of the biggest stories in the past, I don't know, say five years or so, has been Jeffrey Epstein. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it blew me away when it came out. I was like, you know, oh my God, I can't believe it. It was like, hey, didn't you work for this guy? And I was like, there's no way he's involved whatsoever. I don't know what they're talking about. And, of course, the more that came out in this Netflix docuseries, Filthy Rich, came out. And, of course, I jumped right in, you know. I've got to binge this thing to find out what the scoop is. And I was just, like, stunned, speechless. I couldn't believe uh, what I was hearing. And, it, I was, and I was like, wait a second. We're talking 97, 98. This was right in the thick of it. You know, what's going on? How could uh, this be going on right underneath our noses? And, now, you know, but, you know, it's it's two different worlds. There's the owner's world and there's the crew's world. And, um, like, uh, uh, you know, he just, um, the owner just wasn't on board that much on, on his private, uh, on his pri own private, you know, $120 million private yacht. Just didn't hang out that much on board, oddly enough. Well, this scandal has actually affected, I mean, right to the royal family in England. It's, it's sort of got quite a few tentacles that, that go straight across the face of the planet. Now, you joined the Super Yacht Limitless. It was actually your first Super Yacht job, wasn't it, in it 1997? Was, I went from zero to limitless. I mean, all my, uh, I, I had gone to, like I said, I had previously worked in a publishing uh, capacity, uh, photographer, and I decided to switch careers. So I changed it up and decided, you know what? I'm going to become a yachty. Uh, and uh, when I landed my first gig, was on the biggest, most exclusive, luxurious, record-breaking yacht that happened to be splashing in the water. That I mean, it was just launched from Lursen Shipyards in uh, Bremen, Germany, 1997. And brand new crew. And to be a part of that was so exciting. And all of my friends in the yachting were like, damn, Mike, I mean, why don't you just go ahead and start at the top? You know? <laughs> so it was it was my first yacht. I had no experience on yachts. I had, uh, I had been on a couple of little fishing boats that my uncles ran. Uh, but as far as having any experience on deck, line handling, uh, navigation, engine room, bridge management, zero, none at all. Uh, I had I had just gone through an extensive 11 week professional mariner course um, in Florida to kind of prep me and get me up to speed. And I was kind of an old dog in the yachting circle. I mean, I was 34 years old when I joined Limitless, you know, and uh, everybody else was like 19, you know, 20s. You know, they were all like 20 year olds. They were from Britain, uh, uh, England, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand you know, Germany, all over the place. Um, so it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a really a, a different experience for me having a, my first job, being in with it, working with an international crew and um, just starting, you know, going off like on a comet. I mean, I interviewed for the job and the next day I was on a jet headed to Barcelona, just like that. I literally, literally wrote a note to my wife, but she was still at work. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. I had a flight to catch and I didn't want to argue about it. Like I'm leaving, I'm going to Europe. I, I didn't want, cause I was like, I'm going no matter what. So I'll beg for your forgiveness later on. So I literally wrote my wife a note saying, I'm getting on a plane, head to Barcelona. I got a job on a yacht. I'll call you in a couple of days. <laughs> Are you still married to the same woman? No. <laughs> 
I can imagine. <laughs> that wasn't destined to last. <laughs> yeah. So, so I but... just want to clarify to everybody out there that back in 1997, and part of the reason that you are able to talk about this entire thing is because back in 1997, the fact most people didn't sign non-disclosure agreements. So you yeah. are un, under absolutely no legal obligation to not say anything. Correct. So that's something I wanted to get out there first because um, some people might be questioning why we're talking about it. But I mean, it is a huge, it, it's huge. I mean, you know, this man, Jeffrey Epstein, he he was integral through so much in, in, you know, the very highest echelons of society. He was part and parcel of handling so many people's money. Um, he was known for his parties. Um, I, I mean, top of society dealt with him. Yeah. And for this all to come out was just absolutely astounding. I mean, I don't think there was a person on the face of the planet that actually thought this man would ever be highlighted in these kind of accusations. No, I mean, really, when when uh, uh, Les, uh, Leslie Wexter's name was first mentioned, I was like, oh, well, he might have had some financial dealings with him, you know, and that was it. You know, and they're making, obviously, they're make because he's such a huge figure in, you know, the apparel world. Uh, I mean, I think he's one of the longest reigning or was one of the longest reigning CEOs, like 56 years as the CEO of uh, the limited group L brand. So, you know, that was, so I think it was like they want to use it as a lightning rod sort of a comment in my mind. That's what I thought. And then obviously once you, you know, dive into that docuseries and you start hearing and then you even hear it out of his own mouth. I mean, Mr. Wexner made a statement that he was uh, embarrassed how he got, you know, bamboozled by uh, Mr. Epstein uh, that, you know, he let him get away with forty six million dollars of his own uh, money. And I'm like, what? And I couldn't believe these details that were coming out. And I was like, unbelievable. I just had no idea. And uh, I just, I still can't make heads or tails out of what, what was going on, you know. But evidently, uh, Mr. Epstein, uh, he had a habit of recording everybody in all of his residences and his planes, his boats, his islands, wherever. And I think he was kind of like that, uh, Herbert Hoover sort of attitude that I'll get people to do what I want them to do for me by leveraging them because I have video footage of them in a compromising situation. That's the only way I could connect the two dots to where, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get away with uh, not showing up for work for two weeks, you know, much less abscound with 20, with $46 million dollars. <laughs> You know, and go like, ah, let him go. Just let him go. I'm not going to bust his, you know, bust his chops about it. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, for those of you out there that don't know, Wexner was actually the owner of Super Yacht Limitless um, and as well the owner of, well, one of the most companies that most people would know is Victoria's Secret mm -hmm. um, and a very, very wealthy man. Now, when you do a little bit of research, um, it turns out that Epstein actually controlled much of Wexner's fortune at the end. I mean, there was, he borrowed money on behalf of Wexner. He literally ran a lot of his, his business dealings completely. Um, so there was a lot of control that was handed over to Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, he wound up, uh, that residence in Manhattan, used to be uh, Wexner's residence. Uh, that 737 used to be Wexner's 737. I don't know. It's uh, I don't know how he did it. Uh, and like I said, it was, you know, sort of a, a Chinese wall, I guess, was uh, brought up between all on board the Limitless. You know, like I said, we had the crew and we would just go wherever the owner said, like, uh, pick, I'm going to fly down to Antigua, be in Antigua. We're on, we're on our way to Antigua to get ready. I'm going, I want to be in the med, go to Barcelona, pick me up. I'm going to be in Palma, you know, go there. So, you know, we did that. There was a, a few uh, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, our chef went missing. Uh, he disappeared after one night of partying, uh, you know. I mean, back then, crews party. We, we worked hard, but we partied even harder. It was not unusual to race the sun back to the boat to start your next days of work on board. Uh, and Barcelona, you know, you're, we were down there at MB92 Marina, right in the heart of Barcelona. Uh, 
it's a great place to be uh, stationed at, you know, when you're on a super yacht. And so we went out quite often and enjoyed it, you know, enjoyed the nightlife. And one night, we, uh, our uh, chef uh, probably ended up, uh, uh, looked, to, looked to us. We were about four or five uh, strong, our crew, that were at, went to this one club. And uh, Epstein was there. Jeffrey was there with some young ladies. Uh, we knew him from, you know, just his dealings as being Mr. Wexner's uh, financial manager, basically. So he was known to us. Uh, and a chef sort of has a different, he's part of the crew, but he, uh, I, I'm talking about our crew chef, our own crew yeah. chef. He's part of the crew, but he's sort of elevate a little bit uh, above the crew, yeah. sort of just below the captain, but has a more of a relationship with the owner because he works hand in hand usually a lot with the owner's personal chef whenever he comes on board. When, when Mr. Rexner would come on board, he would bring his own personal traveling chef. Not a chef from this residence. I'm talking about, hey, people have no idea how these guys, you know, how these people live, all right? His chef from his house in uh, New Albany didn't come on board the Limitless and cook for him. He had a chef who had their own restaurant. He'd call him up. I'm going to spend a few days on board the Limitless down in the Caribbean. Meet me down there. That's how he did it. So... We had like three chefs, you know, his, his, his residential chef, his traveling chef, and then the crew chef. So he was going to, the chef wanted to stay and party. And we're like, okay, it's like two, three o'clock in the morning. We're getting back. And then the next day he doesn't show up. So we're like, right, you know what? We're big boys. We can handle ourselves. Uh, we can make breakfast and lunch. But then dinner time, we're kind of like, well, he is like the crew. I mean, he's supposed to feed us. That's his job on board. So, Okay. But we're getting worried because, you know, it's Barcelona, there's pickpocketing, there's mugging, things happen, you know, especially for crew members, you know, uh, walking down the side street, all of a sudden you get jumped, you know, mud. Not that it, it's more prevalent in Barcelona, it's not. That happens in Chicago, Miami, New York, you know, L.A., anywhere. So uh, he just, no phone calls, no word, it had been 24 hours and nobody knew where he was. So we started going through the hospitals, emergency rooms, police stations, trying to find him, going back, retracing his steps. You know, did he leave with Jeffrey? We didn't have no idea. Three days went by, no word on his whereabouts until finally we got a phone call that he was indeed with uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, that uh, he had uh, blacked out, taken some drugs, and he was very embarrassed about the whole thing. And uh, they just went back. They flew back to the States. And it took three days for somebody to let us know. So we were just kind of told, you know, hey, don't talk about it. Uh, and you know what? They plugged in another chef in, uh, in the next day. So How often did Jeffrey come on board? Um, he actually, as far as I knew, he had never been on board uh, the Limitless. It was usually uh, some sort of meeting would take place wherever we were docked at. Like... Uh, at a restaurant or a, a bar at the marina or someplace shore base. Uh, he prob he came on board, I know, the one time when we had a meeting with, uh, they had a meeting, not we, that the crew wasn't involved with that, but the owner had a meeting on board uh, with his execs from the limited group or L Brands, um, as far as, the, but that was a business. Uh, it was very much of a family oriented uh, yacht only uh, his uh, entourage, his security detail, and like I said, his, you know, kids on board, so family, wife. Uh, no parties, no, uh, no uh, uh, Victoria's Secret, angels, uh, big blowouts or anything like that. So a lot of people probably think that's what goes on, but no, it doesn't. Were you ever, ever able to see, you know, Jeffrey, when you were ferrying people back and forth to the yacht? Um, did you ever see him in his glory and, and hanging out with a bunch of um, younger women and, and uh, you know, now ha having looked back and seeing what he's been accused of, um, do you think maybe that you were privy to some of what they were um, accusing him of? Maybe that night in Barcelona, um, but, you know, there was, the place was packed with people partying and clubbing and uh, it was Barcelona, uh, so, you know. Uh, 
was I, could I tell what the ages of those young women that, you know, they were all beautiful. They looked like they were all supermodels. Uh, I can understand why the chef didn't want to come back to the boat with us, <laughs> you know, but I was very, uh, and the rest of the crew, not just me, but we were all very conscious of our uh, class in this situation, you know, our station in life. Uh, he was way too close to the owner to be fraternizing with, in my opinion and, and our crew's opinion. Uh, we would not have shared a, uh, a cocktail with an associate of the owner. Just wasn't done. We, we kind of all were trained and knew that, you know, you need to have very distinctive uh, boundaries between the owner and the crew. So uh, we wouldn't have done that. But then again, like I said, the chef is sort of a, in a different category than being really a crew on board because he has a little bit more closer proximity uh, relationship with the owner. Uh, there was an incident down in St. Bart's where uh, we were down there. The owner was coming on board and uh, the, uh, we had a, little, had a little accident. I accidentally ran over the owner's personal valet. <laughs> so... Uh, Ferrying him back, ferrying people back and forth. It was unfortunate. Uh, he just got sucked out of the tender. and uh, But uh, we, he got rushed to the hospital, had some stitches put in his head. And uh, the next day, I was requested by this head of, the owner's head of security to uh, escort him uh, to, Saint, to downtown and uh, run some errands. And we picked up a young lady uh, at one of the premier jewelry stores uh, in, in St. Bart's and drove her to a, a private resort on the far side of the island, uh, basically dropping her off. I thought it was a little weird that, uh, I know it wasn't the owner was there because he was on board. I just left him, he was on board, his family was on board. So it was just me and the head of security and this young lady um, who looked to be probably 20 uh, uh, and dropped her off there. And I just thought that was kind of a weird errand for a part of, for a deck member to run with the head of security, you know, we were picking up uh, some parts that we needed to have flown in, and uh, I guess he made arrangements for some hard to get items uh, from a diff couple of different restaurants, and we ended up uh, uh, having lunch together and discussing some things uh, at one of the very cool and hip Vietnamese restaurants in St. Bart's. But uh, and that was pretty much my only uh, um, uh, sort of. Uh, interaction I ever had um, with, uh, you know, something weird might be going on. Well, in your personal opinion, um, do you think someone like Wexner, having given Jeffrey so much power over his empire, do you think realistically that these people that interacted so closely with Jeffrey would really have no clue as to what he was up to? You know, I, I, it boggles my mind how he could, um, so yeah, he had signed over his power of attorney, you know, and I was like, how could such a powerful man as Mr. Wexner, uh, an icon in the business world, why would he do that? Uh, why would he give up so much power to somebody who basically just kind of came along, uh, you know, one day out of nowhere, you know, uh, it, it just, I, I have no explanation. I can't wrap my head around it. I can't connect the dots to why that would happen, much less why he would let him get away from pilfering $46 million from him. So, you know, without any recourse, kind of saying, oh, I let him, let, let him go, let him get away with it. When really, I mean, when a lot of things uh, I want to, that, that didn't pot, this was not brought up in the uh, docuseries, but I know from being on board, the head of uh, Wexner's uh, security detail was, uh, as told to me by the head of his security detail, he was a former deputy director with the FBI. So that's somebody with some connections, you know. I mean, basically all Les had to do was whisper in his ear, hey, go get my money back. So why he didn't do that, you know, I got no idea. I don't know what to say. It doesn't make any sense. All I can say is if that was me, and I was put in that situation and somebody had stolen $46 million from me and one of my employees was an ex-deputy director of the FBI and all the, the amount of energy and effort that I had to expend in order to get my money back was just say, hey, go get this guy. And I didn't do that. 
then there's probably a damn good reason why I wouldn't do it. And I'll just let you speculate what that might be. But, you know, obviously there was a damn good reason why he never got his money back. So do you think that Mr. Epstein had a lot on? I mean, you know, it's like I said before, the friends that Mr. Epstein had and the people that he associated with were the utmost of the echelon of society, for sure. The movers top and shakers, of yeah, All the movers and shakers. I mean, we're talking about presidents, uh, leaders of industry, royal family members. I mean, these are, you know, and the circles aren't that big when you start getting up in that rare air of the 1% of the 1%. You know, the, we're not talking about tens of thousands of people. You know, it's a really small group of uh, people that circulate. And just like uh, we had we had spoke briefly before about how news gets around in the yachting circles. You know, if you have an accident down the Caribbean, uh, people in uh, uh, Palma, Mallorca are going to hear about it within 24 hours. I mean, word tra news travels fast. Bad news travels like lightning <laughs> throughout the yachting industry. So I can't imagine that all these people that travel in these circles weren't very well aware of his reputation. I mean, we know from uh, interviews with President Trump that he had about speaking about Jeffrey Epstein, you know, how what his reputation was with the young ladies. So you know, people knew about it. You know, um, I don't know what to say. So, you know, maybe he had something on a lot of people. You know, it's like you said, the, the industry is small. Everybody hears about everything. And when you get up to, you know, the one percent of the one percent, um, they all tend to know each other and do business together. So, you know, do you think maybe that, you know, Jeffrey Epstein had something on many of these people that he was able to utilize? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. His strategy seen from, like I said, I'm just picking this uh, information up from the docuseries that uh, a lot of the uh, young ladies uh, that were involved with him said that he had recording devices in all of his residences in his planes, in his uh, boats, in his islands, every place was wired. And uh, I could see that. I mean, you know, if you want people to do your bidding for them and they're more powerful than you, you need leverage. I mean, that's just simple truth of the matter. And in order to get leverage, if you find you have video footage or audio footage of powerful people in compromising situations, that's some pretty good leverage. And then, of course, look what happened in the end. He, you know, the huge conspiracy. Did he commit suicide? Was he murdered? You know, he, the fact is, he's dead now, and it's very convenient for a lot of people that he's dead. So. For you, though, you know, having worked with Mr. Wexner, did you ever have any sense of him being anything other than a family man and a corporate person and somebody who worked hard and looked after his, his sort of... I don't know, universe, as it were. Yeah, no, no, not at all. I never had an inkling. Uh, like I said, he, it was very family orientated uh, on, on board the, the Limitless. Uh, he was very involved in the uh, building, obviously, of such a, it was a huge project for Lurs and shipbuilders. Uh, down to, uh, you know, the, the stern of the Limitless was a, a, would open up. It had a huge door, would open up, drop down into the sea, uh, it would turn into a swim platform because Mrs. Wexner was an avid swimmer. So you would just press a button, these giant hydraulic rams would open up and this thing would lower down and you'd set like these velvet ropes all that went down these teak steps down in the water. There was a whole uh, bar down there. It was just incredibly wonderful. Uh, just, you know, that makes swimming. And then, of course, the security would go out there in jet skis and Uzis and machine guns and, you know, fly all around the place. But when we were down, the first time we were down, the, you know, I was on board the maiden transatlantic voyage. And we headed down uh, over to from the Med to uh, Grand Bahamas to uh, sort of get settled and get everywhere. We didn't go to the States because of the luxury tax. When you have, I don't know, a lot of people know this, but when you have a brand new toy, if it's within one year, you have to pay 20% luxury tax, whatever country you're bringing that into. So we just didn't bring it in that country. But our first time down the Caribbean, it's hot. Uh, people aren't familiar. The Limitless has the dark navy blue paint job on the, on the steel hole and a white superstructure. 
when that Caribbean sun was hitting that dark blue paint and just cooking it, it was several. What happened was those hydraulic ramps just, you know, expanded. And when Mr. Wet and one thing wealthy people hate more than anything in the whole world is when they press a button and nothing happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can he imagine. Pressed button, he pressed the button so this thing would open up and nothing happened. He did not like that at all. And the problem we realized was they didn't take into effect the hot Caribbean sun cooking that blue, dark blue paint and warming that stern up to the point where the rams, you know, so we had to tweak that. But this guy, the owner was out there with a hose trying to cool it down, you know, doing whatever we could. And we were all out there with white sheets thrown over the back. I mean, it was such an ordeal, you know, it was so funny what we were trying to do just to cool it down. And of course, the only way you could cool it down was wait till the sun goes down. <laughs> so you can take a swim when it gets dark. <laughs> Well, it is definitely an interesting life, but, you know, I guess really at the end of the day for you, Mr. Wexner, as far as you're concerned, um, was anything, you know, he, he was basically a good family man. Um, you know, he loved his family. His, his yacht was used for family purposes, but there will always remain that question on why he even went as far as to sign over power of attorney to Jeffrey yeah. Epstein. Yeah, I think any reasonable person can come to the conclusion that he was being leveraged by Jeffrey. Uh, so that Mr. Wexner was definitely being leveraged. There's no earthly reason that I could even grasp why you would let somebody take $46 million out of your account and then not go after them. I don't know. You know, people don't get to be rich for uh, letting things like that happen to them, you know. So I don't know what the reason is for that. I don't know why he signed over the power of attorney. It doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. So yeah, kind of left, you can draw your own conclusions from it. Uh, he, you know, one, one interesting, the other uh, uh, little interaction I had with Mr. Wexner was um, during the transatlantic, uh, the maiden transatlantic voyage that we made across uh, the Atlantic, we were, I just came up with the idea to take the, because it was the largest U.S. flag vessel in the world. I don't know if a lot of people knew that. I mean, if, if you're familiar with the yachting, you'll know that hardly any yachts out there are U.S. flag for tax reasons. You know, they're all flagged in, you know, other countries where the Cayman very, Islands. Yeah, the Cayman <laughs> Islands. Yeah. Exactly. So, but in order, I mean, he had to pull some strings to get the Limitless flagged, a U.S. flag, as a private yacht so he could have that distinction, those bragging rights. I've got the largest U.S. flag yacht in the world um, because it was so huge. They looked at it as it was a ship. It's what is a yacht? The same as 315 feet, 95 meters. You know, this is not somebody's private uh, little yacht. So he had to call some, uh, he had to, they, they actually, I've seen a letter an act of Congress in order to get this thing passed, literally signed by Bill Clinton, the president at the time, uh, to get this thing passed so it could be registered as a private yacht. Yeah. So the idea was, I came up, we were about a day away from landfall in uh, Grand Bahama. I said, let's take the flag, the U.S. flag that's been flying on the back, the stern all the way across, have the whole crew sign it, fold it up, put it in a nice shadow box and present it to uh, Mr. Wexner as a keepsake, as a memento of uh, a big deal. The very first maiden transatlantic voyage, you know, it should be captured somehow, you know, as a memory. And so it was like, man, that's a great idea. Okay, great. One of the deckhands on board um, decided that he was going to clean it up a little bit because it was, I mean, you can imagine uh, a week hauling behind a, a boat. It's covered in salt, soot, just, you know, it was pretty ragged out, so he was going to wash it. The only thing is, he failed to check the settings on, he should have let the interior crew, the stewardesses, handle it, but he jumped on it. He's a he's a go-getter. <laughs> so he failed to realize what the settings were, and they were on hot. Oh, so uh, when he pulled that flag, old Glory, out, she wasn't red, white, and blue any longer. She was pink. Oh, no. So we were like, oh, my God, what'd you do? And they're like, hey, no worries. You know, we had a whole store on board Limitless. You, you'd go back and down into the bowels of the vessel. I mean, it looked like a, a limited store. There was 
shirts and slacks and shorts and t-shirts and all the boat swag and sweaters and robes and everything and a lot of flags and then we had a hundred more flags so we said we'll just go get another new flag and i was like no it's got to be it's got to be that flag it, this is the flag that made it across none of those other flags were flying off the stern when that happened i said screw it let's just go ahead and sign the pink flag it'll be a funny story you know obviously he'll be like why is it pink what's up with that and we're, you know, I'm like, oh, funny you should ask. So we went ahead and signed it, folded it up, and presented it, uh, you know, for the captain to present to Mr. Wexter when he came on board. And that was the end of that. You know, he, he enjoyed it. He thought it was funny. And then about a year later, voila, the pink brand was born. So I don't know if that had anything to do with that. I think it's a coincidental. I think it's a funny story. But oddly enough, after he was presented with a pink flag, he started, he launched a uh, new line uh, called Pink, which you may or may not be aware of. Well, you know what? It's a good story. And I think if you decide that that's the story that, um, you know, sort of launched the pink brand, that's all right too, right? Yeah, I don't know if it launched the brand, but, it, you know, if you think about, you know, hey, well, how'd they come up with that name? Why that? You know, why not red, white, black, whatever? You know, why pink? Why did they come up with that name? What does that signify? And, you know, and I've, I've done my research and I was like, I couldn't find any reason why they decided to come up with that name. And uh, especially on the heels of being presented with a pink flag. So I was like, hey, you know what? Maybe so, maybe not. But it's a good story and it happened. It's true. And that's what happened. So we did present him with the flag and it just so happened to be pink <laughs> <laughs> well do you think we're going to see any more coming out of the jeffrey epstein stories coming forward into the future uh you know I, normally i think the average uh, person would say obviously there's a lot more to be uh to, to unfold here but you know, if you go back and check your history of other scandals, especially that involve the uh, the utmost echelon of uh, wealthy and privileged, they seem to have a uh, a certain ability to scrub, you know, the the story clean and to make something nothing. So, are the are the the powers that be the people that are most affected by this working their butts off to make sure that uh, you know, this doesn't go any further than the Netflix documentary, probably. Uh, so if I had, if I was a betting man, I bet that they'll kill it. You know, they'll kill it. That's, I mean, you, you remember the, uh, the big scandal with the offshore bank accounts, what's it called? Fonseca. Um, you know, and that implicated every billionaire millionaire on the planet from the royal family to the presidents to all prime ministers. I mean, everybody had a, a dog in that show. And um, whatever happened, whatever happened there, you know, everybody was piling their money offshore and hiding it from the tax man. And I haven't heard another word about it. So I think it'll probably go along those lines where it'll just kind of drift off and, uh, you know, they'll sink it out at sea somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, 2020 has definitely given us a lot to think about and, um, you know, maybe taken our eye off a lot of balls. And I tell you, when you go onto social media and any news outlet, the amount of conspiracy th stories out there are huge. So who knows? You know, I mean, really, in this life, who knows? Yeah, definitely. Who knows? Uh, that's for sure. I mean, I have, uh, you know, I started uh, uh, when I uh, retired, you know, I, I left private yachting. Uh, because of the lack of job security, really, of being replaced as easy as somebody snapping their fingers. You know, you can, you can go get a beer at the marina uh, bar, and when you come back, uh, your replacement's already there because you picked the wrong coffee, you know, to uh, put on board. So I went to the commercial side and started working on commercial ships, uh, mainly in the oil field, uh, the offshore oil fields. Uh, like in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and um, it's just more, it was more security for me, but I recently retired from that, and uh, then of course the COVID-19 happened, the pandemic, everybody's on lockdown, you know, and I was like, I've got to, you know, I think, well, what can I do with 20 years of, you know, boating, offshore water experience, ship experience, 
you know, to uh, start, you know, kind of my my own gig and and try to do a, a branch out in social media like a YouTube channel, you know, and try to share my experience with other people and to help people. If you're interested, like I did, I went from having no experience to working on a super yacht or to getting my master's license and running, uh, uh, you know, very big vessels. You know, if that's something you might be interested in doing, you know, let me show you how you do it. I'll show you how I did it and you can decide for yourself. And along the way, we'll, you know, we'll talk about little stories of misadventures like we have, because there's a lot, a lot can happen uh, out there in the yachting world. Uh, so I decided to do something like that, just to kind of keep my connection with the yachting world and um, stay relevant and um, you know, try to, you know, start a new venture. Well, I have to say, in today's day and age, it seems like the United States, as far as crew goes, have come a lot further than the rest of the world as far as contracts go. It's not so easy anymore. Um, unfortunately, the United States is known as a litigious society, um, so people are very, very careful with their contracts. Things are built in. The you know, there's unions. There's there's so many different things that happen in the United States that make it almost impossible um, to treat employees the same way that they used to or crew the same way they used to back in 1997, 1998. When you come to other countries, for example, Europe, straight across the board, uh, England, it still is fairly easy to get rid of your crew for one reason or the other because the laws aren't in place. But I know that there are many organizations that are looking at changing those laws and making job security uh, a little bit more um secure <laughs> yeah but it, I without think that, so. it's lagging behind but i mean they're they really like in this day and age and now in 2020 with the uh stcw regulations you know before you know especially in the private i mean a chartering when you're taking money to take people on board you, you have to meet a different threshold but private yachting you could virtually i mean if the insurance company or the, the boat was going to be underwritten by the owner you know his uh, next door neighbor could captain the boat. It's private. There's no oversight. You know, it's, it's only the insurance companies that started the oversight on a lot of these private yachts going, no, 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 we want the captain and the crew to have some sort of certifications as far as, uh, you know, first aid CPR, water survival, life saving, things like that. So, but back in the day, that wasn't the case. And so now everybody has to be heavily certified. And like you said earlier, it is like a, like a hamster wheel effect. You know, once you get on there and you've invested so much time and money in your licensing and your certifications, you got to keep it going. You know, uh, all these things have uh, either two year, four year, five year renewal, or you have to have refresher courses, which is a good thing, obviously, when it comes to saving somebody's life. I mean, having an emergency on board, I've experienced that. And I'm so glad that my crew, you know, was well versed in emergency procedures, you know, on board when that happened. So yeah, it's definitely, and I think salaries um, and job security contracts, it's lagging behind, but it'll eventually catch up because it's going to have to. Uh, the one thing, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of people, at least when I was on, on board, we're kind of on retainer. And if you got a good crew on board, whether they're working on board or even they're on board or not, you still have to pay that crew. Because if you mm -hmm. stop paying somebody, they're just going to leave. They're just going to go work on another boat. So you have to keep a crew on retainer, and you need a contract for that. You're not, you can't keep them working 365 days. Some, some vessels do that. Some crews do work 365 days out of the year, you know, with very limited time off. And when the owners or guests are on board, it's a 24-7 gig. There's none of this, uh, you have mandatory, I mean, they might say that, but that's, that's not the case. In, real, in the real world, you're working, you're doing whatever, as long as the guest is up, the crew is up. You might have to be able to swap off depending on the size of the vessel. Some deckhands can sleep while others stay awake, but basically the crew's up. The guests are up, the crew's up. They stay up till three, crew's up till three. And then you got to get up at, you know, the crack of dawn to get everything ready for the next day. And you start doing that, you know, it's hard, but that's the life. You know, now the balance is when the, when the owners aren't on board and there's no guest on board, it's your vessel. Things are a lot more, you know, tranquil. You know, just everybody's chilled out a little bit more, a lot more. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, no matter who fights the battle, when we're talking about an owner-operated yacht, it's like their home. So I guess 
it doesn't matter how much legislation is put into place. The fact yes. is you are an employee inside their home. If they don't like your mannerisms, it is their home. So, yeah, you know, it's there's going to be a, a weird bit of a balancing act, I think, with that. And again, just due to the simple fact that we are talking about this level of society, I don't think it's ever going to be perfectly fair as far as employment yeah. rules go, but you do get paid awfully well to do the job that you do. No, that, that's that's fact. As far as the in, in the private yachting, uh, the money that uh, people can make in chartering and private yachts, super yachts is uh, phenomenal. People have no idea the kind of money that's involved. It, it's crazy. Uh, just in, in shipping, but in commercial side, it's pretty good too. I mean, yeah. you know, I was up, I was up making well over $1,000 a day. You know, yeah. the money is good out there for your life, but it has to be because, it, you know, you got to pay to play, you know, to have those big licenses, to have be deep, uh, dynamic positioning certified, and, you know, to have your, your top tier designation certification, it costs a lot of money. So you need to make money if you don't want to pay for that. But when you brought up that about the uh, no matter how much uh, regulations put in place, you're basically in an extension of their private home. And even in business, and every company has an HR department, there are all kinds of stuff that happens every day. You're like, that's not right. They shouldn't do that. And it happens. So you can just imagine what it's like on a super yacht. But one of my experience happened to be, um, <laughs> and I made the mistake. Normally, I had a rule on board, no fraternizing with the crew between each other, even though it's hard to enforce. But because the owners... And the guests can pick up on uh, a bad vibe. If, if two crew members have had an argument or a love spat, they pick that up. And then they're like, why do I feel uncomfortable on my own yacht? Because you guys are not having a good, you know. So they'll fire everybody just like that. So I'm like, no fraternizing amongst the crew. You can go to other boats and date other crew members all you want. But um, and, and normally uh, captain and stewardesses marrying and working together, it's kind of a hard thing. I don't know how people do it. I don't think, I certainly couldn't do it. I tried to do it with my wife on one of my boats. And uh, the problem was, it was that relationship with the owner. The owner, had, we had just finished a cruise with the family on board. Everybody had a wonderful time. My wife was great. She was uh, very little experience on board. You know, it was just kind of like, check it out, see if you might like to do this. I thought it'd be great. She could work with me. And then the second trip, not the family, more of a guy's uh, trip out. And uh, it went well. I mean, no problems. My wife didn't think much of it. And she was, I guess it was hard for her to keep that look off her face. And so on the next charter, the next trip out with the owner, he called me aside and said, uh, let's go ahead and get another stewardess. Uh, tell your wife she can stay at, stay at home for this one. <laughs> so I was like, no, no problem. You know, I mean, that's what you say. Whenever, whatever they say, it's yes, sir, no problem. You got it. That's all they want to hear. They don't want to hear about the labor pains. Just show me the baby, right? Yeah. So I told my wife, hey, look, you're kind of told to stay home on this one. And she was like, for what? And he said, he told me if he wanted a woman to look at him the way you looked at him, he would have brought his wife on board. <laughs> so she, said, <laughs> she was like, well, I couldn't help it. I couldn't believe he was doing the stuff he was doing. I said, no, it's his boat. It's his gold. He can make the rules as he sees fit. All you do is just act like it's not bothering you. So, well, and I guess that's what you get paid the big bucks for, right? <laughs> that's right. You got to have that face. Like, it's You've got to be an actor. You got to be an actor straight through. Yeah. So, what's next for you, Mike? What now that you've gotten out of the commercial sector? Where are you headed now? Well, uh, I'm going to take a little venture into this whole social media realm. I uh, started a, a YouTube channel about uh, working on super yachts, working on yachts and commercial vessels. It's called On Deck with Mike Stewart, and um, I'd like to eventually spread out, maybe uh, uh, do some podcasting. Um, do some go to different places. Uh, I still have lots of friends, lots of contacts, and all the yachting uh, uh, centers all over the world. I'd like to do you know interviews with them and and see what the latest and greatest is. And you know boat shows as much as I despise being in one, uh, you know they're a lot of fun. 
for people who aren't working one. <laughs> so, you know, to go and uh, look at the new uh, yachts. I mean, uh, Lurson has a lot of new projects coming out. I mean, the, the things that are coming out these days are mind boggling. You know, I mean, Dilbar, enough said. I mean, that's crazy, you know, but. So I'm just thinking to do that, maybe, um, you know, try that for a while and see how that goes and maybe help some people that decide they want to get into the industry because it, it is an industry with a high turnover rate. A lot of people just come for uh, the summer, you know, to work a summer in the med because they're in between uh, university years or they just want to take a little vacation where they can work and get paid for it. You know, you can do that. You can do that on a yacht. Uh, it doesn't have to be a career. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to get my license and become a captain or a, or a chief stew on a 100-meter a uh, yacht. You don't have to do that. You can just go and, and have fun for a year. So there is a high turnover uh, rate, and there's always going to be new people that want to get into the industry. So I thought maybe I'd try, to, try and help them uh, succeed at that. Well, actually, we'll make sure to provide a link to On Deck with Mike Stewart, um, and hopefully people head on over and sign up to your YouTube channel. Mike, I thank you very, very much for your contribution today and, uh, you know, for your insight in, into some of the things that have happened as well, just into the world of yachting and, and super yachts. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be here. Well, maybe we'll catch up again soon one day, and you can let us know how your latest venture is going. Oh, absolutely. Look forward to it. Wonderful. Once again, you've been watching another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. Our thanks goes out to Mike Stewart. My name is Rhea. I have been your host. Tune in again for another episode.